Welcome everybody. Uh, it's 7 a.m. Uh, Central European time and 2 p.m. in Singapore time. So we'll be starting. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, today's webinar will be approximately one hour plus a Q&A session at the end. So you can ask your questions. If you have questions, just put them in the, the question and answer box. Um, today, you'll be hearing four unique perspectives on NBIOT, people working on uh, really in the field. And then also uh, we'll be recording. So you can expect an email in a few days with the, with the webinar recording as well. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, today's panelists. So we have Terrence Wong from the GSMA, Mark Atkinson from Telstra, uh, Gonzag Fravel will be speaking on behalf of Mirada, and of course myself, Stephen Lurie on behalf of IHRUP. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker. So we have Terrence Wong of GSMA. Terrence, are you ready? Uh, thank you, Stephen. Let me open my slide. Can you see it? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Terence. I'm uh, working for GSMA in the APAC region. So I'm very glad to share you about today on the APAC IoT opportunity and also uh, more about the MB IoT sustain sustainability. So who is GSMA? Uh, we are a mobile industry association representing more than uh, 700, 750 mobile operator worldwide and also with member uh, from a wider mobile ecosystem, including device manufacturer, uh, equipment vendor, uh, network supplier, and of course, different kind of uh, solutions supplier in uh, along the supply chain and also on different vertical application. Every year, we host a very large uh, industry conference, Mobile World Congress, MWC at uh, Barcelona. Uh, last month, we also have a physical hybrid event in Shanghai and also Los Angeles. And also this year, we also have Africa. And we also have regional conference, Mobile Fee 60 and the online event uh, five. So all together, we bring along uh, more than uh, a few hundred thousand people together to shake the industry every year. So GSMA Intelligent, which is our uh, market research arm, uh, we did about IoT analysis. So how big is the IoT market? Uh, today, we have 4 billion IoT revenue uh, already, and then moving to 2025, we expect will be double, moving to uh, 900 billion of opportunity. Regarding to the number of devices, today, uh, 30 billion, and then it will, on 2025, it will be 24 billion. So, we are very focusing on licensed technology using the cellular technology. Today, there are 2 billion IoT devices connected using 2GPG, 4G, 5G, and of course, uh, MBLT and LTM, this kind of low power wireless technology. And moving forward, uh, we expect that uh, today, MBLT, LTM, which is part of the uh, 5G massive IoT technology, will be jumping from existing to, uh, 200 billion to 1.1 billion opportunity, which is, means almost five times from today. So where are these opportunity? Yes, it is everywhere. But I, want to hi I would like to highlight, actually Asia Pacific is one of the biggest opportunity with more than one third of contribution in terms of the revenue, 340 fee out of the nine billion. So is there any impact on the COVID-19 uh, regarding to the growth? Yes, there are some slightly impact at the very beginning, uh, especially in the first two year, 2021 up to 2024, maybe uh, less than four or 5% of growth impact. But then after the in initial contraction, uh, actually we see a lot of enterprise government pushing for digital transformation and also, uh, also government support with their roadmap. So on, on the digital, uh, uh, digital uh, society, for example. So we see that growth will be catch up very quickly and then we'll be only have uh, less than 2% difference 
compare with the uh, report that we done in 2019. So we still believe um, the number of total ILT connection will reach to uh, 24, 24 uh, billion. Uh, so different region, of course, they will have the different impact due to the length of the lockdown and also uh, government uh, official stimulus package put in place to help the financial recovery. Um, and the good, good thing is Asia Pacific actually is the least impacted region with the IoT being used to, to come back to, uh, to COVID-19. Uh, for example, uh, the government in China, they accelerate the investment in the 5G infrastructure, uh, including uh, putting 5G AI and initial IoT to boost the consumption, also develop new business of opportunity, new business model, and then we see a lot of uh, good use cases, uh, how IoT 5G used, to, for example, putting a thermal, uh, thermal camera or a face recognition camera in the entrance of building uh, or putting the drone uh, disinfected uh, robotic, you know, to uh, protect the society. So we see a lot of this use case and will be continued to, to be adopted. So from the enterprise perspective, actually there are a lot of good reason for uh, adopting IoT. Uh, I think one of the key things is the digital transformation. So we, we did a survey and then uh, there are a lot of good, uh, besides the digital transformation as the key agenda, there are also a lot of uh, reason, for example, saving the cost, uh, improving the operation efficiency, uh, enhancing the customer experience. These are all good benefits. And of course, there are also uh, government compliance, right? Putting the meter smart, right? There are a lot of uh, utility sector adopting smart meter, for example. But then like what I've said before, there are some slight, uh, some short impact at the very beginning, like the uh, pressure on CapEx or a project on hold due to can uh, sign the contract with the face-to-face -face meeting or the supply chain issue. But there will be a, a balance or compromise because of all the rise of the 5G network, more mature of the uh, new uh, technology like AR, AI, edge cloud computing, and also the rise of robotic, uh, AGV or AML. So these are all very good reasons for moving to one the uh, common, common goal of enterprise for digital, digital transformation. So another, uh, interesting uh, report done by Ericsson. They are even more optimistic, more optim optimistic than 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 in the in their report. So they categorize all the cellular technology into three things. One is the existing, uh, long lasting technology already to GVG over 15, 20 years, legacy IoT connection. And the second category is the uh, massive IoT which is already mentioned, which part of the uh, 5G features uh, using the low power wireless technology. And then the third one is the broadband IoT and critical IoT, uh, talking about very low latency and very, very large bandwidth. So this all technology actually in the chain, you see that uh, except to GPG, uh, they will be dropping down because of the cost of the network. But then the massive IoT actually among all the cellular technology, which is going the faster one. I think the one, one of the reasons of because this technology actually can, can support uh, low power consumption, which means the device can be run in a rural area for long lasting without changing the factory or any in, human interaction. And also it could cover a long distance and also a deep penetration. These are all very strong reasons a uh, strong financial benefit to lower the investment on the capex and also the operation cost in the opex. So, and also um, because the 5G features, uh, a massive IoT can support uh, 1 million devices in uh, per one kilo, uh, one square kilometer, which means the cost will be further drive down once the scale going, going up. So for GSMA, actually, we work very hard with our member to roll out the technology. Uh, as of today, uh, there are a lot of uh, commercial network available already, 155 commercial uh, roll out in 56 markets all over the world. And there are many, many chipset model uh, developer, kit, developer kits already available, which drive down a lot in the cost. 
and they are all, our member also supporting the ecosystem development. So today we already have over 47 labs open in, in the world, in uh, 21 market. And we also building the ecosystem with more than uh, 2,600 innovators who supply not only module chipset network, but also develop different application for, uh, for the enterprise and also from, for the public sector. So this is a very good uh, coverage map to show you where are uh, this network. So you see actually the blue color indicate where the MBLT deployed. It. You see most of them in Asia. And then there are also CAT M1, another technology, uh, which is already deployed also uh, around the world with the red color. And there are hybrid, uh, hybrid uh, technology also deployed in some of the market, which is highlighted in the purple color. So you see, actually, you can easily get support uh, because of the uh, global coverage and the global uh, uh, ecosystem already deployed this solution today. So let's look at about uh, uh, how this technology, actually, there are many wireless uh, technology to support IoT device connection. So here is a very simple diagram to give you some idea in two dimension, uh, categorized as uh, power consumption and also the uh, coverage capability. So for your home, I think most of you would use Wi-Fi, which is a, a very short, short distance uh, technology and also high power consumption, but it's easy and easy to, to, to set it up. And then, uh, there are also some uh, short range wireless technology, but low power like Bluetooth CP. And cellular, cellular technology, of course, is well available already today with a very good coverage. And then there are other uh, long license, uh, low, power, low power wireless technology like lower six box. And also I already, or I already mentioned the LTEM and MBLT. Here I would like to say MBLT actually is very outstanding in terms of the low power consumption capability, and also have a very, very good coverage. So our member Ericsson and Telstra, they already rolled out the MBT IoT, IoT technology in Australia, which can cover 100 kilometer and more. So this is another dimension to compare the technology uh, with the uh, license and non-license technology. I think a good thing is, of course, license technology like MBLT, they will be with less interference weeks, right? Uh, they can support in different kind of radio range from 2G to 5G, 2G, 3G, 4G up to 5G. And then they have a very uh, good coverage already mentioned. And also they, their device power cost is uh, much lower than existing 2G, 3G, 4G. And they support a very good uh, sufficient throughput for uplink, uplink, upload a lot of data into the cloud server. Of course, they are also able to support uh, over the air for uh, uh, software or firmware update in the device size. In case you, you can't access the device easily or want to save power, you can just update the software over the air very quickly and easily. And of course, this uh, FGPP standard is a global uh, proven uh, long lasting technology like 2G, 3G uh, already lasts for, for uh, 20 or 15 years. And of course, it supports the uh, interoperability which means the device can pop into different network or, or moving around in the same country or even outside the country with the roaming support. And it is end-to-end -end secure with LTE standard encrypted over the air. So recently, Deutsche Telekom just published a very good comparison report on different kind of uh, low, low power wireless technology. You can feel free to visit their website or see the uh, link be below. And a very key feature is coming from FGPP on MBLT, why it can save uh, a lot of power for the device size, why it can support long battery life with uh, the two key feature, which is the power saving mode and also the uh, extend sleep cycle mode, which is a EDRX. So this feature actually improve a lot on the overhead, on the communication. So we already uh, provide a very good uh, deployment guideline in our GSMA website, which describe all the FGPP features in MBLT and LTEM in uh, release 30 up to release 15. And of course, as I mentioned, it's a, a very good technology on penetration as well. It can uh, 
have a 20, 20, 20, 20 dB more uh, uh, performance, which means that it can penetrate to two to three double brick walls, which enable connectivity of object in underground and car, and, and car park or basement, which means a lot of uh, pipeline or, or, or metering can be deported there and still able to connect these uh, devices. So GSMA working very hard to support our app member to, uh, on the roaming. So we have different kind of working group working on the framework and provide different documents for device uh, connection, efficiency guidelines support our innovator to develop devices which can be tested on different network. Uh, there are common profile for operator to use so that the device can be seamless with uh, similar performance in different network. And of course, there are also standard format for uh, the billing and settlement, and there are also charging principle for roaming. These are all available. And our member actually already used this guideline to deploy the uh, roaming. Uh, for example, Dodge Telecom working with a uh, different operator, including AT&T, Vodafone to uh, roll out uh, MBLT, which can cover more than 20 country, including US. Uh, this MBLT is a long lasting technology. So it's already adopted in the release 16 as part of the 5G massive IoT standard. So it means that this technology can coexist with 5G running over the light radio and also connect to 5G core network besides the existing 4G. So this, we believe this technology will be very, very long lasting, which means what you invest today will be very sustainable and keep using for a long, long time. And of course, the standard keep improving the technology for better efficiency, uh, better mobility and better network management. And in the next release, um, this technology will be a study on how it can be support on non-terrestrial network. It may be covered by satellite in some day so that uh, in very rural area or even in the ocean, this technology is still working. So in the APAC, actually, I work very closely uh, with my member set up the uh, APAC IoT community uh, in two and a half years ago or already. So right now, today, we have more than 60 members all over the region and also in Middle East and Africa. So our aim is to facilitate, to scale up the opportunity in the region and build up the ecosystem together. So besides the operator, we also work very closely with the local organization like IoT Association in different country and also working with the local government agency and their developer program as well. So now we already have hundreds of innovators in our APAC region, which uh, not only provide the module chipset, but also provide different kind of vertical solution. So globally, we have an IoT directory with list over 2000 innovators who can provide solution on different sectors like agriculture, logistics, access checking, industrial, IoT manufacturing, uh, smart buildings, smart homes, smart city, transportation, automotive, and of course, utility and metering, and also consumer variable and health as well. So welcome to visit this website to find a partner to work with you uh, or support your innovation. Uh, finally, uh, APAC is uh, keep uh, improving our innovation. Uh, we used to adopt a lot of uh, innovation from the West, but now we also seeing a lot of innovation in this region. So we support members to doing a lot of good case study to report their success in different uh, application in different sector. Uh, last year, we published a, a case study with uh, support from uh, uh, a lot of members in over 10 countries. So feel free to go to the website to download this uh, case study. So besides a uh, uh, large company enterprise operator, we also work support startup. So this company is a company, e fishery is a startup from Indonesia. So they build an e feeder at the very beginning. We, we promote the technology MBLD and then they adopt it to build a feeder. So now this feeder already deployed in Indonesia, more than uh, 3,000 fish farm. So this feeder can feed the fish automatically uh, to save a lot of uh, manpower efficiency and also reduce underfeed or overfeed, making the fish uh, more healthy and also protect the environment. Now, actually, uh, 
this is a win-win situation. The farmer adopt the solution also make their yield and more profitable uh, than, uh, with 20% uh, more. So now this company already go to more than 100 people and also deploy their solution uh, be, besides uh, beyond Indonesia. And also they got serious uh, funding, uh, more, more funding from venture capital. Every year, I think their revenue is more than uh, 10 million already. So this is one of good example. So welcome to work with uh, GSMA and our community and our member uh, so that we can build an ecosystem together continuously. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Terence. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, so again, my name is Stephen Lurie, and I'll be talking to you about how device management is key to building not just great NB IoT solutions, but really sustainable IoT uh, strategies. Um, how do we advance this here? Uh, IoT Ups Adventure, for those of you who don't know, is officially started back in 2016, uh, but it actually goes back further to 2011 when our co founders started working with the Open Mobile Alliance on lightweight M2M. -M. And our vision is IoT requires certain device management services to become economically scalable, and that interoperability and standardization will become increasingly strategic with adoption. And everything we've done uh, since has really been about that core vision of rationalizing IoT economics. That is putting in place the pieces that unlock other people's IoT strategies. Um, and with that, it's really interesting to think about sustainability. You know, at the core of this idea of sustainability, we have this idea of creating long-term value. And this can almost be broken down into a mathematical formula. Of what is the different value points divided by the cost? And to do this, organizations really need to be aware of a solution's life cycle from development to decommissioning and make sure that they've, they've addressed each step properly. Um, this is really technically challenging for a lot of organizations because there's technical aspects and there's also business aspects, but it's especially so for LP1s like NBIoT. Um, I think a good thing to keep in mind is that these solutions are not deploy and forget. Um, they have long life cycles often, but they're more deploy and manage. So we're talking about solutions with life cycles often of 10 plus years. And so in that sense, you know, sometimes I hear about fail proof of concepts and you would almost rather have a failed proof of concept than a quote unquote, a successful proof of concept if your strategy isn't fundamentally sound. Um, so with that, I'm gonna talk about NBIO tech, NBIOT technical challenges today, but I'm also gonna bring it around to, to business and strategy. Um, development is really determinant as to solution quality and long-term economic success. The choices you make here are gonna to decide to a great degree your outcome. Um, it is interesting to note that uh, our typical customer profile is someone who started by building proprietary solutions. They figured out that doesn't work. They moved to an open source lightweight m to approach. They struggle there. And then finally, they move over to work with IATROP uh, and our offerings. Um, and this really goes back to, to something that people need to understand about IoT, which is this kind of iceberg principle. Uh, initially, the problem is seen as getting data from a device over a network, and most engineers can do that. But uh, once these solutions move from testing to production, when they move from laboratory to the field, the challenges really grow, and the technology becomes a time-consuming distraction. And that's really the key point. Nothing should get in the way of bringing great NBIoT products to market. Uh, and this is, again, especially challenging for things like NBIoT, where we measure success literally in our solutions. We're measuring pico amps, we're measuring bytes per message, and, and literally pennies per device. So everything you do, every choice you make, is going to relate back often to operational expenses and capital expenses. Um, and two examples I would call uh, out are, are, for example, memory footprint. Uh, our SDK, there's device management services on the device, and ours are actually the most compact in the industry. So out of the box, you save money on your device costs by being able to use more constrained device with, with less memory. 
Another advantage is, is just the simplicity of developing the abstraction work that's been done there. And so you gain on time to market. So I'll talk about this later with our customer, Alvaco. Um, they developed a smart water metering solution in just a few months. And this is a huge advantage for them to get product into the marketplace. So with that, I'm gonna talk about a few of the more specific challenges related to the IoT. Um, you know, during preparation for this webinar, uh, Mark Atkinson, who's, who's one of our panelists today, mentioned IoT has existed for a long time and what is really changing is the scale. And I thought that was such a good point. You know, Australia, his continent, is expecting to see 10 million NBIoT lightweight end to M smart water meters deployed in the next few years. And we really need to think about what is needed to manage 10 million smart meters in a competitive marketplace. You know, who does this best will probably get the lion's share of the marketplace. So it's this idea of sustainability is important, but beyond sustainability, you need to be as good or better than your competition. So um, as these smart meters begin their 10 plus year lives, uh, they'll all need to be bootstrapped. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with this concept, the process of bootstrapping a device is a little bit like setting up your new phone. It already has connectivity, but you'll need to give it the proper security credentials and make sure the proper software installed. Now multiply that by millions of devices. And, and then things only begin here. So the devices will need other device management services over its lifetime. You'll need to monitor it and optimize it for battery life. Someday you may need to revoke security certificates or reissue certificates. These devices sometimes lose settings, so you need to be able to recover them. And you need to all do this, all have zero touch services to do all this. And so it kind of goes back to that iceberg analogy. You need a plan to deal with these issues. And many times, a lot of, a lot of our customers don't know all the issues until they've gotten there. Um, I think next, you know, was, is NBIoT is talking about connectivity and, and NBIoT as an LP1 is very challenging. And it starts with the bandwidth is very limited. Uh, these are high latency networks, so they're very slow. So the, the turnaround on, on, on the data is, is long. There's a lack of network homogenization. So even though this is a standard, not all the networks work exactly the same. And then there's also a lot of, there's a lack of developer experience using these networks. So developers often try to apply the wrong technology. Um, I think that's really important to understand is that many of the technologies used to build the internet and legacy IoT solutions. So TCP IP, MQTT, TLS are just too heavy and power hungry for NBIoT solutions. They don't work uh, quite simply. Um, and so lightweight NTM uses co-op for data transferred over NBIoT. It also uses DTLS for security, which although not designed specifically for constrained environments works pretty well. Uh, and so handling data transport with co-op and DTLS is absolutely the right approach. Uh, there's lots of research. I provided links here to, to show that. But once you've done that, you still have the challenge of getting your data upstream to the servers, to the cloud, to all, all your upstream infrastructure, where everything, again, is IP. So remember, beyond device side energy efficiency and device cost, uh, you still have the networks and, the, and your cloud uh, infrastructure providers, which aren't free either. So your solution is only going to be as competitive as your least efficient link. Um, so what is needed is a way to easily build the solutions. We've provided that with Iowa, but also then you need infrastructure to bridge these worlds and manage the devices. Uh, we've built that, we call that Alaska. Um, and so these pieces, the idea behind here is that you have everything you need to quickly build solutions and monetize these solutions. Um, so with that, um, another key piece that comes up often in these solutions is what we call firmware updates or FODA. Uh, and we've been having a lot of conversations about this recently. And I think this is due in great part, I don't know if you're aware, but there were regulations that passed in, in the US and Europe last year. And there are important things to keep in mind um, FODA is now a real or de facto require, uh, requirement on almost all deployments. Uh, it's just you can't build a secure solution without this. Um, it also helps to keep the solutions operationally relevant. So, for example, if you need to change your data reporting frequency or a data format, something like that, um, it also helps you address the regulatory issues, legislative issues, 
um, security flaws like the massive TCP IP vulnerability that was discovered last year. But the problem is, is that when you do a photo update, you also consume energy. And, and energy is, is really critical in this world. So with Lightweight M MTAM, we've done a lot of work to minimize these energy issues by making the code very compact and, and making the mechanism to do the photo a single composite read-write action. So it's, it's as efficient as possible. But the other thing that people need to understand when they're putting in place services like Foda is that doing it wrong actually can create device vulnerabilities. So when you go with a standardized approach that many people have, have worked on, like Lightweight M2M, you have a known manageable risk service. And that's really important as you go to build one or multiple products, because that's going to affect your ability to control your security testing costs, uh, which is something other our clients like iTron have brought up which is really important to them. And they also wanna be know that other people's devices that are gonna be on their, uh, on their uh, networks are gonna be secure as well. Um, and of course, then you want it really easy to implement. So if you look at here on the bottom right, we show the five lines of code that are needed to implement photo on IODREP. So you create your package and then just five simple lines of code. From the administrator standpoint, you can see there, it's just a few clicks of a mouse a little to the left. And then finally, another key point is that everything is based on the lightweight MDEM standard. So you deploy, let's say you create a product and you deploy it in one country, and then maybe your customer wants to use another device manager uh, provider in another country, as long as it, because it adheres to lightweight M2M, it doesn't matter. So there's a really key point of supporting your business strategy of, of making, making it about choice and not technical limitations. Uh, another thing that comes up more and more increasingly, thank goodness, is security. And you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that these device, devices are going to produce the goods and services we need to live. So water, energy, food, healthcare, all these things absolutely must be secure. Um, there are regulatory and privacy issues to consider as well. And you know, for us, the, the term that we talk about is, uh, is security starts with what we call zero trust architecture, meaning you need all these services like authentication encryption. Um, it must meet uh, legislative regulations. It's got to be economically and operationally scalable for IoT. So you can't send out service people. And that's a key point, which is nobody should physically handle the security certificates. That's just a good security practice. Um, and remember, with IoT, if you build it, you own it. These devices are gonna have long lifespans. Um, they're gonna be out there for 10 plus years in many cases. And that's the whole point, which is bad strategy choices, bad techno technology choices will be costly. And I could even say that it's arguable at least that bad security choices could even be deadly. Um, so lightweight end to end, because it's an open standard, it benefits from the contributions of a community of security effort, uh, experts. And I think that's another issue, which is, there's the closed proprietary approaches are gonna find, find it hard to beat this kind of um, focus and, and scalability and, and scale of all these actors working on this. Um, and just in general, I think finding the right security energy balance on battery operated NMB IoT is really tricky. And, and that's why I included the next slide. Um, so these battery operated uh, smart metering solutions on NBIoT must be as energy as efficient as possible. If you keep a device in, the, in a deployed one year longer, that dramatically affects your ROI. And so increasingly our customers are turning to technologies like NIDD and Oscor for these types of solutions where there's an absolute premium on energy efficiency. So NIDD or non-IP data delivery it strips out all the energy consuming IP encapsulation. And so it really optimizes your transport. And then Oscor is the first uh, protocol that was really designed for IoT constrained security. And what you do is by combining this with NIDD, you have a very super efficient, um, a secure data reporting mechanism. Um, and it goes back to cost, energy efficiency. And, and of course, it secures the data at the application level. So it's really one of the most secure approaches to security as well. 
All these things I've talked about today are, are really come back to uh, expertise. Um, and you know, as an organization, at some point, you have to ask yourself, what's our expertise? How do we create value? And so increasingly, our customers want to focus on the solutions and less so on the technology. Um, so in addition to you know, things I've mentioned, like the qualitative aspects, time to market, there's an economic logic for all this as well, which is when you, the cost of device management from our standpoint is, is, is fractional to the total solution to voice, so total solution costs. But it also reduces the total solution costs. So you're talking about a small piece of pie that you're actively reducing as well. Um, but you know, don't take my word for it because I'm just a marketing person, right? Um, I, I included some proof points here, and this is one of our customers. Uh, IOTRUP and ITRON are both part of the Open Mobile Alliance, and ITRON has participated in several of our webinars. Uh, they also use our SDK. And they've said it, they want everybody in their ecosystem, ecosystem to use lightweight end to end. And I love how uh, David Howard uh, puts this saying he, he wants open, modular and standardized from device to cloud. Um, we should, we should, good, this is perfect, can't be any better. And I guess why, why is the question? And it, it goes back to economics and, you know, accelerating innovation. Um, and in the video, which unfortunately we don't have time to watch today, uh, he does a great job of calling out all these things and, and the links in here. And you'll receive, of course, a copy of the presentation in a couple of days so you can watch the video. But it's very interesting what he has to say. Um, sorry. Uh, same thing about our next customer, EDMI, very similar to iTron and, and IOTRIP's other customers. Uh, what's interesting about them is they really did a very thorough evaluation of marketplace needs and product strategy. And their conclusion is, is that uh, lightweight end to M and a managed stack for lightweight M is absolutely the way to go. David Rowe, who's responsible for, for building their products um, is very pro NBIOT. He, he, wouldn't, he doesn't wanna dabble with any other type of LP1 technology, uh, non-licensed LP1 technology. And he's also very pro IOTRUP. Um, this is a very, this is a shorter video and I highly recommend it. Um, and of course you can sign up for the full webinar at the end, we've provided the link. And then finally, uh, an another customer is Elvaco. And so Elvaco is really interesting. Uh, they built an NBIOT solution, uh, a smart metering solution. Uh, and they started by trying to build their own solution. They moved to open source and uh, IHRAP after a few months, they were able to build um, their first solution. And since then they haven't looked back. Um, and they actually have a good problem, which is they can't actually keep product in stock. They're selling more than they can keep in stock. That's always a good problem to have when you're a company. Um, so with that, why IOTROP? And so basically we built these pieces here. Our solutions were built to support any IOT strategy. So consumer or industrial from development to deployment to invoicing they're ready and the goal is to, was to provide everything needed to accelerate your business. Uh, our whole organization is focused on this. Um, plus you get the benefits of the lightweight end to end community behind that as well. So they're focused on improving this product. Uh, there's been innovations, with lightweight end to end 1.2. And finally, IOTIP increasingly is considered a trusted experience partner on these journeys. So we're here to help uh, and we're already supporting organizations around the world. Um, Thank you. Uh, please contact us. Uh, everything starts with a conversation. Also, I've taken the liberty to provide links to past and future webinars you might find interesting. And with that, please let me introduce Mark Atkinson of Telstra. Uh, thanks, Dan. Let me just set up the uh, screen share on this. Can you just confirm that that's rendered correctly, Sue? Yep, works. Yep, all good. Yeah, that's good. Yep, cool. Thank you. All right, so um, thanks, Daniel. My name's Mark Atkinson. Thank you for the introduction, mate. Um, and I'm uh, I'm at Telstra. I'm what we call referred to as a domain lead. 
for industrial IoT, I mean, the principal part of that means I, I do all the real IoT work as far as I can, I'm concerned with my colleagues. I'm part of Telstra Enterprise. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is um, real world MBIT solution sustainability. Um, what does that mean? Well, Terence has talked about the scaling of um, MBIOT uh, from the perspective of uh, GSMA, uh, the number of MNOs that are out there, uh, the, the number of uh, MBIOT uh, devices that we see coming as an LP WAN solution. Uh, and students talked to her briefly about the challenges about effective device management, and effective use of an MBIOT network, which are all critical things. Uh, from my side, I'm going to focus on um, the outcome aspects of using uh, a network rather than necessarily the technical aspects and why you choose MBIOT as the LP WAN of choice uh, and the key takeaways from some real projects. So I guess the, the first point from my side is, I guess like all IoT, you would think, well, MBIOT is nothing new, right? We've measured things for a long time. So how hard can it be? Uh, and we look here, um, actually, a, this is a standard Telstra slide. This is a submarine on the left. And I used to work in submarines. It's interesting. But um, you've got the incremental cost. It was very high previously. Um, and the, um, the, the devices we connected was low in quantity, as you can see along the bottom. And we've moved very quickly over the last couple of decades to uh, the collection of uh, a large number of assets, still high valued assets, aircraft. We moved through to things like smart metering, SCADA systems deployed. Uh, now we move to vehicles putting everything onto standardized cellular networks to the point where we've got ubiquitous devices all over the place. You can, you can um, monitor your bike, you can monitor your cat, your dog, you can monitor your parents, you can monitor your children. Okay, so it's, it's sort of, it's basically everywhere. So how hard can that be is often the, the question people ask us. Um, from Telstra's perspective, we, we look at five key aspects of the um, solution. We, we see it in terms of the hardware that, that make it up, the network, which is you know cellular, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, other technologies, the platform, which is the ability to collect the data or ingest the data, manage the devices, and then the clever part on top: applications, um, dashboards to present that to you in a pedagogic way, analytics so you know how to use the information and can draw knowledge from it, workflow, etc., and services. So they're, they're all key parts. take advantage of the rest of the system and leverage it. So Mark, Mark, I think your microphone's having problems. We're not hearing you very clearly. Can you see? Um, is that better? A little better. Uh, so there, are, there are three phases oh, of that, MBIOT. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Um, I've just moved in a direction on the microphone. Three phases of MBIOT sustainability from Telstra's perspective. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it's all about getting an outcome for a business. Um, connecting things, analyzing what you've connected. So this is all about leveraging the data um, and making sure that you can draw insights from that data and, and using it in a way that the business gets benefit. Um, and then uh, as a result of that, we see the real benefits coming when you automate, okay? So that's, they're the key aspects. Now, your challenge is the, the connectivity. And we, we talked a lot earlier about that in, in the presentation that Steve gave as well. If you can't connect, you can't analyze, and you can't automate. And so as a result, you effectively lose the advantage of a lot of the advantage of the system. So in that case, um, in our side, we, we're looking at, as um, Stephen mentioned before, we're looking at services here where we're connecting, you know, um, large volumes of meters in the Australian market. Um, we're looking at services where people have very challenging scenarios. So, so why, why MBIT is the long range low power outcome of choice? Um, there's some really good work done on this, and I won't talk to all of these in detail, but there's um, some Deutsche Telekom slides up here. Um, you'll see in um, the GSMA presentation, the reference to that, and I'll reference it to our, my one when we publish these. Really good study comparing different technologies uh, and their performance in terms of you know, data rate under different conditions, uh, reception under different conditions. Um, so the critical factors are scale. You've got the great support of uh, GSMA, and the number of people who are getting on board this. And what does that mean to you? That means to anybody out there that you're reducing the cost base and you're going to access massive innovation. There are just you know, devices, people working on this. There's a whole rat, um, ecosystem that you can plug in at real scale. Um, re reliability of connections. Okay, I'll, I'll go in detail and range. You can see here that uh, uh, Mark, Mark your, your mic dropped out again. Um, we're using unlicensed 
Mark, Mark, we, we can't hear you. We lost your, we lost audio. Just one second. That's better. Okay. Um, hang on. Sorry. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, again, range, um, referring here to a study which was done by a, a couple of institutions that the NBIT is, as a technology, consistently outperforms. And lastly, energy consumption. Um, you know, we mentioned in the last presentation that um, battery life is critical to these sort of devices. And under real conditions, um, assuming you've got a payload over total K, and again, there's another study referenced here, which I'll provide the details to, you know, NBIT comes out the, the clear winner. Um, and this is reflected in the Australian market. There are a number of, um, you know, water agencies, which is a real tough gig um, to deliver in these services. Um, two of the major water authorities in Victoria um, who have gone through an extensive process over about 18 months to choose an LP WAN technology of choice, and they've landed on MBIOT um, to reflect these findings. So you look at the um, scenario now in Australia, what does our network look like? This is the coverage we have. To give a, some statistics on that, and then to give it a perspective for, uh, I think our Asian neighbours know what Australia looks like. This gives you an idea for Europeans, um, the sort of area we're covering with this technology. Uh, and you can see that you're basically talking about Portugal to Moscow, um, you know, from Scandinavia all the way down to halfway through Turkey or Syria. Um, and we've got the population of Austria. So it's a pretty challenging scenario for us. And what that means to, is that we've been forced to innovate and innovate a lot. So typically with 3GPP, we get a 35 to 40 kilometer radius from a planning perspective. Um, in Telstra's case, um, you know, we, we realized that wasn't gonna be enough. And so we've done a lot of work um, and as Terence mentioned, you know, we picked up an award from GSMA for the, what we've achieved there with Ericsson with 120 kilometer range. Um, and what does that mean? It means that we're used to tackling these edge cases. What do those edge cases look like? And here's a ninth, this is a production. So this isn't a, you know, let's put something in and see how far it will get. This is a production 93 kilometer MBIOT service. Um, it's mounted on a pole there. So that's not an antenna mounting. We just mounted, you know, the MBIOT device on a pole to pick that up. Another, another use case, this is five metres below ground for one of our customers. Um, so again, you know, getting access to the capability to do that. And here are some of the things you don't think about when you're making a plot. You, you can consider some of those earlier ones. But uh, the example on the left here, as I said, we're doing a lot of use cases in Australia at the moment, you know, around water. Um, you know, submersion of a device, so it'll just suddenly disappear, um, almost literally, but also from an RF perspective. Um, Unexpected loss of signal in the middle where someone's decided to, uh, you know, well, I've suddenly got a trailer, I'm just going to move that and camp that between your device uh, and, the, and your base station. Um, and the third one on the right there is some interesting slides which show, um, you know, the, the water meter on the right, someone actually planted a tree right next to it. And as the tree's grown, they decided to keep trimming the tree with a chainsaw or an axe to, to protect the meter. I'm not sure how the service is like that. And on the left, someone came up with an innovative um, and, and artistic uh, solution and basically bricked up the water meter, uh, which was great. So they're the sort of unique edge cases you, you're not preparing yourself for. Um, what, what would I say about those? It, it is important to work with someone who's like a, um, uh, a mobile network operator. Or someone who's got the scale. Mark, Mark your, your microphone dropped out again. who has the scale and the capability to support you through those use cases um, is a very important aspect. Um, and generally you'll find with MBOT, you're working with people who are, you know, um, communication network, um, mobile network operators to do that. So how do we tackle these issues? So we look at it from the MBOT as a platform. Uh, I won't talk um, in great detail about the platform aspects here. I think a lot of those were covered by Stephen really well in the previous presentation. Um, the things I will call out are the need for your platform to be, um, you know, reusable, repeatable, and scalable. Um, particular things are the, the ability of that platform to do more than one thing. So you don't, you don't want to stick to a silo-style solution. They're not a good option moving forward in, in a, um, an IoT-type world. 
Um, for example, if you're, if you're taking a platform which is only capable of doing water or only capable of doing something like street lights, it's important it's got flexibility. Um, it's important that it does have an ability to reduce the burden on, on the fleet management with things like over-the-air updates. So you don't have to go to site to continue to upgrade devices and zero touch deployment, which simplifies you know, the, the field services. Um, and I, the other aspects there. When I talk about silos, this is a, um, a Telstra map of what makes uh, a smart community. Um, the, the solution that Telstra deploys when we look at this is a device management platform that's capable of supporting each of these silos. Um, why is that important? Because it significantly reduces your cost of ownership in the future, which is critical for you um, when you're out there in the field. So you can start, and a lot of our customers do, with a water network solution, which is vertical nine here. Uh, you can move quickly to other things, you know, asset tracking, vehicle tracking, uh, pollution environment monitoring. They're the typical things people roll out. But you shouldn't need to continually upgrade your systems and add new systems and new work. Okay, so that's why the importance of not going down a silo outcome path. The other point, um, it's not just about the technology as well. You've got to remember this is not set and forget. So there's actually a service management model that you'll need to have to be successful. And that starts with you know, reporting, the ability to address issues, the ability to do you know, traditional telco service management, so activate and deactivate. And I won't talk to all of these in detail, but and it finishes up, of course, making sure that you can effectively manage the platforms of people, the technology. These are um, really critical aspects of successfully managing your system. And these sit um, over and above the actual technology solution you've got. Uh, in my experience, if you don't address this and you're running a complex environment or, or a large scale environment, you're, you're going to run into trouble. So again, what could possibly go wrong? Um, in terms of the real world, we talk now about, you know, what are the do's and don'ts in, um, of MBIOT implementations and sustaining. Um, I strongly recommend that you avoid silos and walled gardens. Um, they lock you into expensive integration and closed ecosystems. And what does that mean? You can't leverage the scale and the innovation that we talked about in the previous two uh, presentations. And it also means that it's going to cost you more. Um, when you're dealing with siloed systems, as I mentioned, you're going to have to do a lot of integration. You're going to have to train people how to use them differently, etc. So going for a different vertical for each one is not a good outcome from your perspective. Likewise, um, there are what you know we, we refer to in the telecom game as walled gardens, uh, and this is a solution which is either completely proprietary or it has a very small number of people who sign up to that. Uh, let's call it a standard or, or that use case. Um, and typically with a walled garden, the scenario you get is a proprietary technology that um, is very difficult to onboard other solutions, so you can't take advantage of innovation. But in addition to that, um, those proprietary technologies don't come down in cost. So uh, I'll give you an example in the Australian marketplace. Uh, about 10 years ago, um, a lot of smart meeting was rolled out using proprietary technology. At the time, cellular technology was very expensive. Cellular data was very expensive. Um, but when we roll forward 10 years and we see the, the volume of um, uh, support and activity in the cellular space, um, the prices of those devices from that, the proprietary solution are about the same and the capability is a little bit better. But when you look at cellular, the prices in Australia have been smashed to less than 40% of what they were 10 years ago. The device costs have been smashed. Um, you know, going forward, we just see that those, those reductions and improvements will keep coming. So if you put yourself inside a walled garden, you're not getting the advantage of that scale that brings you innovation and price driving, okay? Likewise, um, in terms of knowing your business, you're going on a transformation. And this was mentioned in the earlier presentations as well. So you need to know, focus on the outcome. What, what is it that you're looking for? Are you looking at data as a service to solve a problem or, or information about how your system runs? You really need to know who is an end, the end-to-end -end owner? And it can be you, you know, for example, as a customer or, or, or an IT manager, um, or it can be a service operator on your behalf. But if you don't have clarity of that, you're going to end up with a lot of finger pointing, making your project difficult to run, okay, and your service difficult to, to work effectively. Um, so my advice on that is you need to partner up or you need to skill up. So 
you need to find an outcome provider that can come to you and talk to those sort of capabilities, um, or you need to get your people upskilled to do that. Um, and the challenge you'll find in most organisations is that these are new responsibilities. Um, and again, using that water metering analogy, because that's something pretty hot in our market at the moment, if you're moving from a paper-based um, or a semi-automated water meter reading scenario and you move to a fully digital system, which is automated, there is a lot of change in your internal business process and you need to get across that really quickly um, or bring someone to the table who can help you reach that outcome easily. Last one, understanding the system level issues. And, and, and this is, um, leads us on to um, the next point with regard to our, um, our devices. Um, you really need to understand how you, you manage your devices impacts your actual outcome. Um, a really common problem we see with people is setting incorrect configurations. Um, it's a classical scenario, the device is either being pinged or it's constantly coming up to transmit uh, and you'll get that ping, 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 and then within months, you know, low battery alert and it's gone and you thought it was going to have a life of years. So that's really important. Um, another one is clear configuration guidelines around how your devices are configured. Having over the air upgrade is, is a really big plus. You can, you can remotely configure your device and save on a truck roll. Um, in the electricity space, we do this all the time okay, because we've got unlimited access to power. In the battery powered device world, if, the, if you um, continue to do an upgrade over the air, you're going to run out of, out of battery power and then you're going to run out of device life. It's going to have a major issue and you're going to have a truck roll. Um, you might as well have gone to read it. Okay, so it's very important that you understand how your devices work and how they configure. So I guess from my perspective, that, that leads us on to that the devices are the, the next key part in that um, MBIOT sustaining problem space. So in that case, I was going to move on from there. And throw that over to um, Gonzaga, if you're ready to do a presentation there on the, uh, the actual devices themselves. Yes, thank you, Mark. I'm ready. So uh, I will take over to share my screen. So uh, I guess you can see my presentation. Um, yeah. I, I'm, gl I'm glad to be part of this webinar together with uh, IoT Europe, uh, GSMA, and Telstra. So my name is Gonzag. I'm, I'm uh, from Murata uh, Electronics Singapore. So I'm in charge of the uh, wireless connectivity modules for uh, Southeast Asia and Oceania and India uh, area. So during my presentation today, I will focus more on the device side and especially on the wireless connectivity modules that bring the uh, connectivity so that connect the device to the network and to the platform and eventually to the cloud. Uh, so in, in the first portion, I will explain about Murata company, uh, what is our module solution and uh, what is our lineup, including the uh, NBIoT and KT modules. Uh, then in the second part, I will focus on the topic of today, the NBIoT device sustainability and the different, uh, I would say, uh, aspects to, uh, to guarantee this sustainability. And then uh, before concluding my presentation. So regarding Murata, uh, this is a Japanese company headquartered in Kyoto and established in 1944 uh, that uh, designs and manufactured electronic components and uh, that also include the wireless connectivity modules. So uh, we have more than 20 years experience in uh, uh, RF module uh, design and manufacturing with, with, that you can see on the, on the right side. And uh, actually uh, half of the module uh, shipped into the market are coming from Murata. Uh, so we have the uh, number one uh, market share in the world and we, are, uh, we have a supply capacity of uh, 30 million modules per month, which are uh, manufactured in our factory in China and Japan. So why use the module solution? And basically, actually, uh, all this uh, communication uh, connectivity is provided by the chipset, by radio chipset, and also uh, the, the processing by processors. And these are all uh, ICs. And uh, our service is to provide an integrating connectivity module in order to save the effort uh, for the device manufacturer in terms of the different certifications including the regulatory certifications and the operator certification all over the world. Uh, of course, to offload the complexity of the design and 
including the uh, ICs, the, all the components, RF components, RF design, as well as the sourcing of these components and to provide a compact solution, especially for a space constraint application, and then to avoid uh, all the testing and uh, all investment related to uh, uh, whatever is required to test the RF or the power performance. Uh, so this is a picture showing our different uh, um, um, uh, options in terms of uh, modules uh, available. So we have uh, three NBIoT modules, two already in mass production and one in development, and as well as also three uh, dual mode CATM NBIoT modules. So basically, uh, we are working with two chipset partners, uh, MediaTek for the NBIoT only module, and then uh, Sony Alter uh, for the uh, uh, KTM1, uh, uh, NB1, NB2, and also uh, variants that uh, uh, embed or support the 2G fallback for countries that uh, still rely on 2G. So then I would like to move to the topic of today and uh, starting with the uh, uh, standardization. So basically, I think uh, uh, this part were already covered by uh, Terence. And um, so uh, I will go quickly and just to, uh, to uh, uh, in, in order to recapitulate that there is a broad ecosystem uh, behind the uh, cellular uh, LPWA technologies, including the 3GPP that is responsible for uh, all this uh, standardization and issuing the release basically uh, uh, pretty much every year to improve the standards, as well as certification bodies like GSMF, GCF or PTCRB that ensure the compliance, uh, is, uh, including from the uh, hardware and from the uh, uh, connectivity module sites. Then uh, a GSMA and a Bridge Alliance in APAC, as well as all the uh, mobile networks operators and MVNOs. So there are two standards that have been defined to address uh, IoT uh, using cellular communications. Uh, uh, the first one is KTM1, and the second one is KT, uh, uh, NBIoT. So uh, basically, these two technologies are complementary, and KTM1 is more suitable for application for applications requiring. Uh, faster data rate and uh, also eventually mobility as well as a short latency. While NBIoT is is more uh, suitable for application with a, a, a moderate or lower uh, data rate, uh, less mobility, uh, eventually uh, static and lower latency, as well as uh, 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 requiring a cheaper uh, implementation in terms of the hardware. Uh, so then the, uh, these standards are being defined in the release 13 of uh, the 3GPP in 2016. And as you can see on the table of the bottom, so th these standards are uh, regularly uh, improved, adding some new features, for instance, release, release 14 that define or specify CATM2 and CATNB2, and especially CATNB2 uh, uh, is aimed at uh, one of the aspects is to increase the data rate. So for the download, uh, multiply by five, and for the upload is multiplied by three. And uh, moving forward to 5G, uh, this, uh, these two uh, uh, technologies will be also uh, integrated and implemented step-by-step, step, I, I, I will say uh, uh, by phase, which I explain in the next slide. And this is to ensure uh, interoperability for devices in, in the long term, uh, probably up to 10 or 15 or more years. And actually, so the other DR upgrade that is supporting through the communication modules uh, can help to be compliant and to integrate just by uh, over the air uh, so, uh, upgrade of the whole fleet of devices on the field uh, to comply with these new uh, uh, improvements and uh, regulations. Uh, there will be several paths to 5G. And actually, in this presentation, we are focusing more on 5G IoT. There are some other uh, um, use cases for 5G, including the uh, uh, very high capacity and enhanced uh, broadband. This is more, more for mobile phone, or uh, also uh, uh, application requiring ultra low latency, uh, like self-driving cars or some uh, mission critical broadband, or uh, maybe other applications. But basically, I will say in terms of IoT, the requirements are, uh, generally speaking, the long range, the low power, and the low cost, uh, which are similar uh, uh, from 4G to 5G. 
So in terms of uh, implementation, what we are uh, expecting, and this is the direction from the, uh, the specification in the 3GPP, is that um, as, a, as a phase one, uh, there will be a smooth transition from 4G to 5G IoT. Uh, 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 leveraging the existing low and mid bands uh, spectrum that is the same for LTE but using uh, our, uh, 4G core and then moving forward uh, uh, once the, uh, the uh, uh, network are being deployed moving to uh, 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 completely standalone 5G uh, with a 5G core. Uh, then the uh, next aspect is the scalability, and uh, so um, actually I would say in my experience, uh, connecting to the mobile network, especially using an integrated uh, connectivity module, is uh, pretty easy. Uh, I would say it's pretty much uh, automatic because uh, usually the uh, worldwide bands are supported in a module, and these bands can be, uh, let's say, scanned and selected automatically. Uh, uh, whatever the, the country where the uh, device is deployed. And uh, providing that the configuration is already set up, then the, the module and the device will connect automatically to the public network. And then these protocols allow to connect to the major uh, cloud uh, and IoT platforms, such as uh, AWS or Azure or uh, Pelion, uh, using a number of different protocols that are already supported, like MQTT, HTTPS, CoAP, UDP, and uh, uh, many others. Um, then, uh, once the device are already deployed on the field, and providing there's, there will be might be a need to upgrade the whole fleet of, of device, uh, it's possible by firmware upgrade over the air. Uh, it means that whenever there will be a new firmware, a new firmware upgrade, then the uh, the delta. The, the, the parts of the software that need to be up, upgraded uh, in the device is stored in the, uh, in the Fota server and then can directly be uh, upgraded on all the device already deployed. And the last aspect is the SIM card. So the, the SIM actually is the, is the mean for a secure network authentication of the device on, uh, on each uh, operated network. And in a module, uh, this has been simplified use, uh, using uh, embedded SIM. It means that the, uh, the SIM card is solderable and is directly embedded in the module and uh, is additionally reprogrammable. It means that uh, it's possible to switch network or, uh, during the device uh, uh, lifetime. And another technology is the iSIM, the integrated SIM. It means that the SIM card is directly integrated in the silicone. So uh, these two uh, SIM technology uh, uh, will make it, let, I would say, actually more secure uh, because uh, now they are located in hard to locate or uh, um, separate enclave uh, that may, uh, will make it more robust uh, in terms of the security and also in terms of the management and cost. Uh, there will be uh, no need in the future to source and to manage uh, different SIP cards from different operators all over the world, but just using this uh, reprogrammable SIM card uh, concept to easily uh, deploy devices in, in different uh, regions. So uh, these technology are uh, suitable for long range. <laughs> so basically, there are many uh, different uh, uh, wireless uh, uh, communication protocol uh, available. Uh, many are addressing short range like Wi-Fi, Zigbee, and BLE. And I will say this KTM and BIoT are uh, uh, very relevant for applications that require long range up to uh, 10 kilometers uh, or um, for outdoor or eventually in outreach location. Uh, that can happen, for instance, for meters when they are located in basement or uh, other uh, devices that are in remote areas, and as well as some applications that need to be managed and to operate 24-7, uh, um, thanks to the, uh, the availability of the cellular network. So then you can see that these applications are, are, covered, uh, are covering uh, different uh, use cases in the smart city. Uh, such as metering or street lighting or smart parking, environmental monitoring, and, and many other uh, for uh, smart agriculture and aquaculture, wearables, trackers, and uh, many uh, use cases in the industry. Um, I, I selected or I pick up a few examples of uh, de uh, deployment in APAC. 
So the first one is uh, for a water meter in Japan. So actually, uh, this is to automate the reading of the of the of the consumption of the water and to reduce the operator maintenance and uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, constraints is uh, for this device is to be able to operate on single battery for more than 10 years and eventually for the meter companies to uh, to scale and to deploy their meters uh, not only in japan but eventually in many other countries all over the world so the reason why for selecting murata is because of the reliability of our module Uh, the security feature that we are offering, the uh, firmware over, over the air uh, uh, service, as well as the eSIM and iSIM. And another use case is uh, for livestock tracking. Uh, we have several customers uh, using different uh, kind of trackers or form factor. Uh, so actually the collar can be one of them, uh, especially in uh, New Zealand and uh, South Korea. So to, uh, to easily track uh, the location and eventually the health the health of the uh, cattle, like uh, cows, and to reduce the manpower on, on the field as well. So uh, for that, they needed to have a small form factor and uh, also to have um, to ensure the uh, network availability. So basically, they needed to have a long range. So they selected uh, uh, KTM1 and NBIoT. And also for some of the use case, uh, the GPS, especially for tracking, can be required. So this is also supported in our module solution. And the last example is uh, for pest control in Singapore. So basically, um, in order to, uh, to um, more efficiently uh, manage uh, the, the identification and the mapping of the pest activities inside the buildings and in the facilities, So, and also to reduce the manual check on site. Uh, so, uh, uh, NPI, NBIOT uh, solution was uh, uh, selected. And some of the uh, constraints include to be able to operate on a single battery for more than uh, three years. And eventually in this, uh, in this industry, usually um, uh, there is less expertise in terms of the hardware and the software design. So one of the reasons to work with Murata is because of the technical support that we are able to offer, uh, as well as the partnerships uh, that we can introduce in this ecosystem to, to uh, bring the solution to the market. Uh, so uh, this slide uh, is uh, summarizing the, uh, the, uh, this use case actually Uh, in the Southeast Asia, which I would say are pretty much the same in every country. Of course, there is a variation depending on the needs, but uh, every country is facing the similar challenge. So we are expecting that uh, by 2025, probably there will be a need to, uh, there will be a, a demand of more than 100 million devices uh, deployed for to address these different use cases. And then another aspect is the low power. So this technology uh, leveraging the uh, low power RF communications, like the short time to uh, connect and register to the network and also the low, uh, low current consumption used to transmit and receive, as well as the uh, two power saving modes, uh, PSM, so it means that the device is going into hibernation and EDRX, it means that the device is just Uh, listening to the network uh, from time to time that is, is possible to achieve uh, an operation during uh, 10 or 15 years on a single battery. And uh, last, uh, last but not least, the security. So uh, the, the cellular network is probably one of the most secure, I would say, uh, especially its uh, infrastructure. It's using a license bands and uh, the cellular encryption is uh, the cellular communication are using uh, 256 uh, bit AES encryption. Uh, then the, uh, the device are also uh, secure uh, using the SIM card for the network authentic authentication. Then the IMEI, that is the unique identification mobile already uh, um, informed on the module side. And then uh, some secure elements uh, inside the module that can help to source some, uh, some uh, uh, sensitive data like uh, uh, certificates or encryption keys. And then in terms of application, uh, as explained by, uh, by um, I, IoT Europe, uh, Steve in, in, in his presentation, so um, LWM2M and, uh, provides the uh, uh, new solution, and uh, especially including OSCOR, that is a compact application layer security encryption, 
uh, that can help to save resources uh, on the module and on, on a network size, and but that means also that can help to save uh, some uh, power consumption. Uh, same for NYDD that enable uh, lighter communications uh, as well as uh, other features. So then I'm coming to my conclusion and. Um, just to, to recapitulate, so Murata is able to offer a broad lineup of uh, these different connectivity modules. Then we have been through the different aspects uh, of the NBIoT device sustainability, including the standardization, the scalability, the long range, the low power and the security, and uh, um, as well as the large ecosystem that is already in place uh, to address all this uh, 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 emerging challenging application by using cellular IoT. Um, so this is my contact details. If you have any question about my presentation, please feel free to contact me. And I also added a few uh, useful links related to uh, these uh, uh, topics of today. Thank you very much uh, for listening to my presentation. Um, Steve, uh, I, will, I will hand over the ball to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gonzag. Uh... Uh, good. Well, th th that's the um, that's the uh, end of our webinar. There, um, we've been actually answering the questions while we were going through there, so most of the questions have already been answered. Uh, are there any additional questions that have come up? Let's see. I think most of them have been answered, Terence and, uh, and other people. There's one question. I think most of them have been answered, in fact. Maybe for, we have a question from Jana Ferengi for maybe for Murata Gonzag. Yeah, good point. There's there's a question from uh, Jana Terengi, uh, probably best for for Gonzag to answer, do you need different modules for each different frequency for each different standard? Uh, so the, this is easy to answer. Basically, uh, our, our module support the uh, global bands. So you need only uh, one SQU to, uh, to support for a global. But of course, uh, it, it depends on your application and which technology you plan to use, either NBIoT or KTM1. And uh, Ash, as uh, in, in the presentation from Terence, he was showing the, uh, the uh, already uh, uh, deployed uh, technology in each country. So then that will depend um, uh, where the uh, where um, you are uh, deploying your solution in, in which country. But basically, our module is already supporting the uh, global frequency. And um, I think one other aspect is to be able to compliant with uh, all these uh, new release by 3 gpp is uh, 13, 14, 15. Of course, maybe there is a gap moving to uh, 5G new radio, but all these upgrades are done by software. So it's possible to upgrade uh, uh, our modules only by, uh, let's say, FOTA firmware upgrade over the year, if required. Um. Okay, great. Uh, and in fact, I think Atem Uzlati, uh, IATREP CEO, wanted to add something as well. No, it's fine. It's, um, I mean, Gonzaga has done a very good job in describing the, the, the need of, uh, you know, and the interest of having a, a single SKU that can actually, uh, you know, address the full world in terms of connectivity. That's, that's also where you can uh, save the costs uh, releasing, releasing uh, 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 well, you connected objects in the market very, very easily. Also, uh, Atem, there's a question uh, regarding Oscor. Uh, Oscor required secret secrets. Where are they stored? Can you address uh that? Yeah, indeed. So, uh, as as for DTLS with certificates or even a pre-shared key, so. Uh, the, the, you need to keep those secrets uh, in in a, in a in a in a secure storage. Uh, so most of the time, uh, our customers do do do, do that with the, uh, with storing the secret into a, a secure element uh, or uh, a part of the of the memory that is protected. 
uh, and and typically uh, also what is important is that uh, of course um, uh, regarding the device management capabilities within a device uh, the bootstrap uh, methodology also helps to update those secrets when typically you want to uh, to make sure that you connect to a trusted uh, entity so that you can for example uh, configure and, uh, and, and typically verify that the secrets are, are actually accurate and even change them over, over the year in case you need it. Uh, so um, OSCore doesn't work differently than, than other uh, uh, crypto algorithms and, and relies uh, certainly on, uh, on secure elements to store those secrets. Okay, great. I, I think there's a good question here for uh, Mark. Uh, Telstra um, about signal storms, NVIOT signal storms, and how you handle that. Mark, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Mark, you. Please repeat that. Yeah, so there's a question here about um, how do you manage uh, signaling storms from multiple NVIOT devices, especially when they are ECL2 coverage and therefore using very high repetition setting? Well, I'd actually have to take that one on notice specifically. Um, we, we haven't experienced that in the water space the way, the way we're doing it at the moment. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm happy to take that on board and come back with if I can see where that came from. And I'll, I'll talk to one of our network specialists on it. Okay. Also, there's, there's a question you might be able to help with about, uh, have you seen uh, existing use cases where NIDD is being used? Mark now, yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm looking for the question actually to make sure I pick it up. So, okay, okay. I know from our from our standpoint, uh, we're seeing a lot of interest on on our really the the clients that are working in the the smart metering space, the battery operated smart metering space. That's that's kind of the next generation, the next frontier. Um, and there's also. Uh, Interestingly enough, there's also interest uh, from those same people, the smart lighting space, where there's a real interest in, in doing the best possible jo job of managing the, the network, uh, the amount of traffic over the network to manage uh, traffic cost. Um, so I think the thing to keep in mind is as you scale to millions of devices, every penny saved per device, that adds up pretty quickly. Uh, and it's, it's an issue because you also want to have the most competitive offering in the marketplace. I mean, these, you know, big markets like Australia, where you see deployments of 10 million, those will be won by the people that have the most economically efficient solution. So that's driving that. Yeah. Uh, there's a question here from uh, probably to Terrence Wong. It says, with respect to the standards, there seems to be a disagreement on the level of sensitivity of NBIoT devices. Can you shed more light uh, on that? Or do you, uh, do you know of any specific GSMA 3GPV defined clauses for device sense RF sensitivity? So, so what I understand is about the uh, uh, on the RF sensitive sensitivity. Actually, actually, is a very very uh, good question. Uh, I'm trying to find some information out. Uh, once I got it, I will share to you all. Okay, great. And we'll have his email so you can send him a response after the the webinar. I think that's that's pretty much it for the questions. Um, we we're coming up on uh, an hour and twenty five minutes. Maybe uh, Stephen, what yeah. could what I can just add quickly on the on the uh, receiver sensitivity because this is also uh, what we specify in the module. So for NBIoT, Absolutely. is minus hundred and eight dBm. Okay. And can you answer? Maybe uh, go. But that may de depends on the bands. Okay, there, there was also a question on the PSM state, Gonzag. Do you, do you, uh, there's, there's a, any thoughts on on-demand download request from cloud to NBIoT module and PSM state? 
I'm not sure if you're able to. It's kind of a very open question. Yes, I think uh, I need to think about it. It's a bit tricky, probably. <laughs> yeah, maybe a few more details would be helpful on that question too. Uh, I guess, um, yeah. So it's it's a little bit hard just to answer that question without a little bit more context. Okay. Well, listen. I think uh, we're coming up on an hour and twenty five minutes. Uh, that's that was our goal to do this under an hour and a half. I'd like to thank all the people who attended and and especially all our our participants the webinar. Uh, for their their content here. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, this is all recorded and we should turn around the recording and the presentation. Oh, one last question just came in. Uh, just a big thank you. Okay, great. That's, that's wonderful. Well, once again, thank you. And uh, we'll be doing our next webinar. Uh, it'll be coming up soon on, on April 28th. And we'll be doing that specifically on smart metering. Uh, on the challenges and opportunities there. Uh, look forward to seeing you all there. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Close and out. Bye. Have a nice day.